I'm going to explain how God connected myself to Uganda. Sound good? Okay. Who knows that the Holy Spirit, when he wants to connect you, he's really persistent. I went on a journey. I, I grew up a good Baptist girl, and I learned all the Baptist ways in my church, and I learned all the stories, but I didn't have the power. I would go every time they'd play I Surrender All. Brenda, you remember? Da, 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 da. And I'd be at the front. Jesus, I'm sorry. Jesus. This week, I'm going to be better. This week, I'm going to tell my friends. This week, I'm going to pray. This week, I'm going to read my Bible. And by Tuesday, I was like, <laughs> took me a long time to realize what I was missing. In fact, I had to get so low that one day I screamed in the bathroom, I'm missing something. And I was a pastor's wife with four kids. I looked good on a Sunday. I led worship on a Sunday. But I didn't know yet the power was from the Holy Spirit to live in me, to fill me, to go through me, to overflow. And man, I'm, I'm free now, and I just want to get freer. <laughs> I'd be in my last church, and the Holy Spirit would say, yeah, you guys remember. Carolyn and then Steve, they're good friends of ours. In our last church, the Lord would say, you know, go to the front and dance. Take your scarf off and wave it. And I'm like, I can't. Jesus, no, no. They already think I'm weird. But here, there's so much freedom. You know, I said to Carla, just stay on the floor if you want. Grab a pillow. Settle in. Um, anyways, the connection to Uganda. This could go on long because I'm a talker. So, what time is it? Can somebody give me like a this after 30 minutes? Thank you. Thank you. Um, anyways, um, so one day I was minding my own business and I got a message over messenger from this African boy. He's 25 and I'm like, ah, kind of like who is this kid and what does he want from me in a way, to be honest, because I've been to Africa before. When I came home, all of a sudden I have 500 new African friends. And the conversation is like, hello, mother, how are you? Because they all call you mother out of respect. And because I'm older, I'm getting mother more than auntie, unfortunately. And I, um, and usually the conversation doesn't go far. So I ignored sweet Jeslor and until the Holy Spirit, <laughs> right? Have you ever heard, have you, has he ever like poked on your shoulder until you're like, fine, have you ever heard that poking, 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 or your heart pounding, pounding, pounding? The Holy Spirit is relentless when he has a purpose for you and a connection that needs to be made. So I said, fine. I emailed him back. I talked to him for a bit, and that was it. Two days later, the Lord has never spoken to me in audible, booming voice like, Sharon. He's, but it's a voice that's not your own. It's an idea that you never thought up or could ever come up with. And so he said to me, Ask Jeslor if he has an urgent need. Honestly, I'm not the, like, most obedient kid. I was like, really? Ugh. Like, I already give away a lot of my money. He says, ask him if he has an urgent need. Ask him if he has an urgent need. I said, okay. I messaged Jeslor, do you have an urgent need? He said, because Jeslor would never ask me for money. I know we can be suspicious of our African brothers and sisters. Let me tell you, Jeslor, for one, would never ask me for money. He said, well, actually, in two days, if I don't have $50 U.S., they're going to shut off the electricity. And I'm like, 50 bucks U.S.? I can do that. And that was the beginning of our relationship, and he's grown to be like a son to us. He started calling me auntie. I would say to my husband all the time, I'm his mom. He calls me his auntie, which is fine, but I really am his mom. And then when we got to Africa, our bond, like, deep into the next level, Jeslor never had a father. In fact, he one day was at a gas station with his auntie, and his auntie said, Jeslor, do you want to know who your father is? And he said, sure. And she pointed to a man in the car. She said, he's right there. That's it. He never held him, never talked to him. His dad didn't care. Then his mom, when he was three years old, she died. I believe she took her own life. That's a lot of rejection when your mom won't, can't hang in there for you. Then his grandmother, who was a woman of God, she took him to church. She sold coal to pay his school fees. But at 15 year old, it, and when he was 15, she passed away. So my son, my African son, lived on the street. He was dirty. He says, nobody likes a street kid. They smell. I can't get a shower. You can't get a shower. And um, he lived in a cardboard box. Not anymore. But then he lived in a cardboard box. 
and he had, he'd carry a bag around with a strap around his neck and collect metal, take it in at the end of the day and receive a few coins. But the Holy Spirit would always say to Jezlor, you're going to have a school someday. And you know that little kid held on to that? Can you believe a little kid on the street who stinks, who has to collect scraps, would hold on to that word? Ryan's smiling because you know my Jezlor, right? He held on to that, and guess what? My boy has a school with 208 children, 40 of which don't have a mom and dad, and they sleep there. Some of the kids after school go home, and if they don't have dinner at home, they're welcome back to the school to eat at 8 o'clock. I'm really proud of him. Plus, I found out that he was born in 1993, and that's significant. I had a miscarriage in 1993. I was, had a D and C. You feel really empty. You, you, you can't describe how you feel. And I felt so empty, and I was wondering, could I ever have kids? I want kids, God. My Jesler was born in 1993, right around when I would have had my baby. And the Lord knew even back then that he'd be my son. Isn't that cool? And I always wanted five kids, because Jack is number five, and I'm number five. We always wanted five. And he's my fifth. I mean, come on. I mean, don't you want more of the Holy Spirit? So we spent 10 days in Entebbe. We were actually not, in, we, we were always planning on going to, going to the school, but it took a, a fiery pastor who came to Canada, Pastor Grace. They call him Daddy Grace. He takes care of 600 kids in Africa. Every pastor has an orphanage. Every pastor has a school. They know what we're commissioned to do. Anyways, Daddy Grace in June had asked Jack and I, would we come to Africa to preach? And I was humbled because I'm like, what, would, what on earth do I have to, to, to share? But he convinced me that um, it would be good. And we found out the school was only less than an hour away. So we said, let's go to the pastor's conference. Then let's go and spend time with our African son at the school. For two, over two weeks, we got to spend time with him and watch him in action. And he's a father to the fatherless, even though he had no example. So all things are possible with God. Amen? Our first night in Kampala, um, which is like we had a room right across from Jesler's room, which was a bit of a distance from the school and a crazy ride. Don't ever complain about the roads in Guelph. No, I'm never. As God is my witness, I'm never going to complain again. The first night in Kampala, we woke up. Uh, I woke up. <laughs> it ended up be, we woke up, right, honey? I woke up just before 3 a.m., and the Lord started speaking to me, again, not in an audible voice, but he was almost like sharing this little story, like a parable with me, and I was super curious. I'm like, where's this going? What are you, what are you getting to at? Like, I, so I knew it wasn't my thoughts. I went to bed to sleep. Amen. And I, I woke up and he starts telling me a story in my mind and it was so unusual. And I remember feeling really curious. So I woke my dear husband up, who's very patient with me. I mean, there was netting around the bed. We had already been tangled that night before bed in the netting. It was, it's dangerous with a mosquito net. Um, no, don't think, oh, don't think about, that's not what we were doing. Okay. <laughs> We, there was just an incident, I'll explain later. Okay, so I woke him up and I said, the, God is downloading something to me, you just need to grab paper and a pen. So bless his heart, he gets out of bed. And you know, he went back to sleep and I stayed up with my little flashlight or my phone and my pen and my paper and I started writing for half an hour without stopping until the pen ran out. So I felt his presence. I've never experienced anything supernatural. Maybe some of you have. Our intercessors here, I know you live halfway in heaven and halfway on earth. I don't know. But um, my eyes were closed, yet the room was brighter. And it was cooler. The temperature was cooler. You know what I'm talking about, don't you? I had never experienced it before. Um, and I want to tell you this message today has the power to change your life and to challenge you deeply. So before we start... Uh, yesterday, uh, when I met with my pastors Wednesday, they brought up um, um, our eyes and our ears and our heart. Remember that? And I felt like I should work it in. So in Matthew 13, it's the parable of the sower. And, and of course, most of you know that. If you don't, just read Matthew 13 later. But afterwards, the disciples said, why do you speak to people in parables? Parables are like simple stories, relatable stories to illustrate a spiritual lesson. And Jesus said in verse 13, this is why I speak to them in parables. Though seeing, they do not see. Though hearing, they do not hear or understand. In them is fulfilled the prophecy of Isaiah. 
You will be ever hearing but never understanding. You will be ever seeing but never perceiving. For this people's heart has become calloused. Whoa. They hardly hear with their ears and they have closed their eyes. Otherwise, that's a big otherwise. Here's the turning point. Ready? Otherwise, they might see with their eyes, hear with their ears, understand with their hearts, and what? Turn, and I would what? Heal them. So let's pray before I start. Can you just start with your eyes and touch your eyes right now? As a prophetic act, perhaps, or as a submitting to the Lord Jesus, touch your eyes and say, Heavenly Father, just today open my eyes. Put your hands on your ears. Heavenly Father, just open my ears today. Holy Spirit, open my ears. Just put your hand on your heart and, and oh, we don't want our hearts to be callous, do we? Peel away the layers, God, in our, on our heart. Pick away the callous. God, soften our hearts right now. Amen. As I laid in bed, this is what he started showing me. This is why it was so strange to me. He said, you have one pillow. Okay? You have one fitted sheet. You have one flat sheet. Can you see why I was like, where are you going with this, Lord? And you have one heavy blanket in case it gets cold. He told me to strip the bed. And I'm going to ask you to close your eyes and do that with me. Imagine yourself stripping your bed. Take off all the sheets and take off the pillow. Okay? You're there? Now, fold them one by one and put them in a pile. So first we're going to take the fitted sheet, okay? In the spirit, fitted sheets fold nicely. <laughs> now you're going to fold the flat sheet and put it on top of the fitted, okay? So fold your flat sheets. Then take your heavy blanket and fold it. Put it on top of the flat sheet and then put your pillow on top. Is everybody with me? Now put the pile on your lap. The Lord said to me, Sharon, do you know what that pile is called? It's called enough. It's all you need. You could strip the bed, you could wash your sheets, and you could be put them back on your bed by nighttime. It's all you need. That pile's enough for you. So then he said to me, if you could go to your cupboard right now and you could pull out a second pillow and a second set of sheets, you're doubly blessed. Jesus. I'm going to ask you to just picture yourself going through your kitchen and opening up some cupboards. Maybe you want to go to your walk-in closet. Maybe you don't. <laughs> Some of us have 50 pairs of shoes, but only two feet. And we still want, we still want more. Go into your bathroom, go into your room. Some of us have empty guest rooms with a bed that's never slept in. <clears throat> and look at, look at your things through the same lens that he calls enough. Look through that lens of enough. Go home today and look through the lens of enough. Go home today. You have to add some action to your faith. Amen? I've started looking through my home. I thought I already Marie kondo it. I watched the Marie Kondo shows, and I thought I already did it, but I still have too much. If you don't know who Marie Kondo is, look up at her up on Netflix. I still have too much, and I'm starting to look through my home with the, the lens of enough. So the first thing the Lord is actually saying to us as his followers is this. Here's the truth. Enough is enough. Enough is enough. We've been indoctrinated by our Canadian culture, our first world thinking. We live it, breathe it, see it, and it's been indoctrinated that it's not enough and I need more. It's not the latest phone. I'm carrying around this old phone and everybody else has an iPhone. I need an iPhone. 
not enough for me. I can't be content with this. I deserve more. I work hard. I work hard for my money. I deserve it. He has it. I want it. Everyone else went on a vacation. I didn't. It's not fair. 1 Timothy 6.6 6 says, But godliness with what? Is great gain. Do we believe it's great gain? Godliness with contentment is great gain. I love this verse. For we brought... Say it again. We brought nothing into this world. And guess what? We can take nothing out. So we come in naked and screaming with nothing, and we go out buried in a box with nothing. Nothing. It says in verse 8, but if we have food and clothing, we will be content with that. Any of us ready to be content with just food and clothing? They didn't say food, clothing, a home, and two cars. They just said food and clothing. Was that a, an error in the scripture? <laughs> Probably not. Oh, the kingdom is upside down compared to the world. The kingdom is like, you take what the world's giving and just, you're, you're pretty safe to go with the opposite. It says in verse 9, those who want to get rich fall into temptation and a trap and into many foolish and harmful desires that plunge, plunge. He didn't say, he said plunge. That's a strong word, right? It plunges people into ruin and destruction. Now, he didn't say money is the root of all evil next. He said for the love of money. Money's a really good tool. When I was in Uganda, I wanted more of it. I, I was mad. I was like, God, give me more so I can give more. I want to overflow. I have so much fun giving. I think I'm a, I never knew I'd be this cheerful of a giver. I, it's just, and you can't, it's true, you can't out give, give God. The blessings have come back so many ways. Every which way, not necessarily financially. Like, you know, the pastors that say, write a check and God will give you. And what, not necessarily, but he, he just pours out his blessing on, on the people. He, can, he, he looks down and we're like giving giving. The, the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. Some people eager for money have wandered from the faith. Whoa, that's powerful. They've wandered from the faith because they're eager for money, and they've pierced themselves with many griefs. But you, man of God, what are we supposed to do? Flee. Flee from all this and pursue what? Righteousness, godliness, faith, love, endurance, gentleness. Here's what the, the Lord told me while I was scrubbing the floor a few months ago. He said, this generation has believed a lie that holiness is boring, but in fact, holiness brings freedom. If you've got that lie in your head, scrub your brain today in church. Holiness brings freedom. The, the, the biggest thing the devil will try to tell, especially our teenagers, is that uh, holiness is boring. When you think of the word holiness, don't you think of, um, what's his name in church? Um, who's that, that? Huh? Mr. Bean. Yeah. In church. I don't know. Like, I think, I think we, we have believed a, a lie that holiness is boring. Oh, command. In verse 17, it goes on. Command. Command, Paul was saying to Timothy for his church in Ephesus, command those who are rich in this present world not to be arrogant nor to put their hope in wealth, which is so uncertain, but to put their hope in God who richly provides us with everything for our enjoyment. He's not trying to rob us of our, of our blessings. He just wants our heart. He just wants 100%. He's just not happy with 10. He's not happy with just the tithe even. <laughs> he wants it all. He owns it all. Oh, man, we've told ourselves a lot of lies out of, out of convenience, haven't we? Command them to do good, to be rich in God, good deeds, and to be generous and willing to share. Verse 19, in this way they will lay up treasure for themselves as a firm foundation for the coming age, so that they may take hold, say take hold, of the life that is truly life. Do you guys want to really live? 
All right, then keep your ears and eyes open and your heart soft today. There's some strong statements here, but God is so good. He's got good things planned for us. He really does. So we're just going to ask the Holy Spirit to let that first enough is enough just settle on our hearts right now, okay? Just settle on our hearts. <clears throat> 